Good morning, everybody. We're starting the second session of this morning. Uh, we have the pleasure of having Alexander Kiewitza from AWS, who will tell us about uh, Erasure Qubits in the context of quantum error correction. Thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, and have... But this should work, I see. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and... Uh, I'm very happy that I have the opportunity to talk to you about Erasure Qubits. Um, so this is a joint work with um, Arbel Heim, uh, Jotam uh, Baki, Fernando uh, Danto, and uh, Alex Lesko. And also in the talk, I will tell you a bit about our recent experiment um, that uh, demonstrates this idea of Erasure Qubits. So uh, in this talk, I will be uh, discussing uh, how to solve one of the central problems in quantum inferency, which is how to build uh, fault-tolerant uh, quantum computers. And in particular, I will be uh, focusing on a uh, quantum error correction side of this problem and uh, how we can achieve that with currently available hardware. Um, so in the talk, um, I hope to convince you that it pays off to dig a little bit deeper and realize that uh, what we have is more than just qubits and Pauli noise that we have to deal with. So here's the outline of my talk. Uh, I will start with some uh, basics of quantum error correction with the emphasis on the Tor code and the problem of decoding of the Tor code. Uh, those are uh, very well motivated questions, so very well motivated problems. Uh, and uh, let me emphasize that if we cannot solve the decoding problem efficiently, then there's no hope to have uh, fault-tolerant quantum computers. So definitely we, we have to put a lot of effort into this problem. Uh, and then in the second part of the talk, I will explain to you this uh, idea of erasure qubits. And here we will see that a few simple ideas combined together, uh, they can really uh, benefit us uh, in a significant way. And lastly, if, if time permits, uh, I will uh, say a few words about hardware realization of this idea of erasure qubits. If you want to learn more about uh, that experiment, please check out our archive paper that we put uh, last week. So let's get started. Um, although many people in the audience know the Tor code, uh, I will still very briefly overview this construction uh, so that we're all on the same page. So the Tor code is defined on qubits uh, placed on the edges of some lattice. For instance, we can take the square lattice with periodic boundary conditions. And then we will have two types of parity checks, X and Z parity checks associated with vertices of the lattice and faces of the lattice. Then the uh, toric code uh, code space is defined as plus one eigenspace of parity checks. Um, so that's the construction. So um, this is the CSS code, so uh, we can detect and correct X and Z errors independently. Uh, so let's focus now uh, on Z errors. So we have some uh, code word in the code space of the Torque code, and some Z errors afflict the system as depicted in the figure. Uh, so if we measure Z uh, parity checks, they will all give us plus one because they commute with the error. However, some X parity checks do not commute with this error. So they will give us minus one uh, measurement outcomes. And uh, all the par uh, X type parity checks that give us minus one outcome, uh, they define the syndrome, the error syndrome. In the Torah code, there's this very nice interpretation of what the syndrome is. We can think about uh, Z errors as string-like errors. That's how I depicted them. Um, and uh, the syndrome is the endpoints of those strings. So note that different Z errors can give you the same signature, the same error syndrome. For instance, the light blue error and the dark blue error give you the same syndrome. And they happen to be equivalent. Uh, namely, they differ by stabilizer. If I multiply the, uh, one, uh, the, the light blue error by the uh, stabilizer that corresponds to the shaded faces, I will get the uh, other error, the dark blue. However, there could be errors that have the same syndrome, yet they are not equivalent. Uh, they would form uh, contract, uh, non-contractible loops, um, and uh, th those, those, those should be deemed uh, not equivalent. So now I can 
Sachs simply defined the uh, decoding problem for the Tor code. Uh, basically, given the, uh, the observed syndrome, we want to find a recovery operator that is equivalent to uh, Z errors that happen in the system. And pictorially, uh, what it means is we have uh, some point-like syndromes that we want to pair up, and we want to uh, pair them up in a way that the error and our recovery form a collection of contractible loops. And uh, if, if we get some non-contractible loops, then our uh, decoding will fail. So there are efficient uh, solutions to this problem. For instance, the very well established minimum wave perfect matching decoder. Um, also, uh, there could be further improvements on the minimum wave perfect matching decoder, uh, like the belief uh, matching decoder. And here I would like to emphasize that those are practically useful uh, decoding algorithms. For instance, uh, Google used uh, the belief matching decoder in their uh, recent uh, TORIC, uh, the surface code uh, experiment. So far, I haven't used any structure of uh, noise, uh, but in realistic settings, there could be some uh, structure of noise. For instance, with bosonic qubits, we can have some bias. So for, for simplicity, let's consider uh, IID Pauli noise, where Z error rate is higher than X error rate and Y error rate. Um, so what we would like to do is we would like to leverage uh, this noise structure. We would like to exploit the fact that we know that there is some bias in noise. But we don't want to do it in a, a complex way that we redesign the code or we redesign the layout of qubits. Uh, we would like to have some simple tweak that can leverage the noise bias. So can we do that? Um, so let's see. So in the standard realization of the uh, Torah code, we measure z-checks, but z-checks would be uh, insensitive to the dominant z error. So how about uh, we modify uh, the code a bit, and instead of measuring z-checks, we measure y-checks. Uh, now, uh, roughly speaking, um, the, the, our code will be more sensitive to the dominant error, we will get more information, and therefore we will be able to detect and correct errors uh, more uh, reliably. And indeed, this, this idea works, and a um, similar idea is behind uh, the XZZX surface code that many of you may be familiar with. So um, this brings us to a general idea, uh, how we can improve the performance of uh, codes. Namely, we can apply a, a single qubit Clifford operator uh, to locally, uh, to each qubit, to locally modify the uh, parity checks that we measure. Uh, so you may ask, such a simple idea, is, is this worth even doing? Is this worth optimizing? If we had uh, a vanilla depolarizing noise, it would not give us anything. But if we have some bias in the noise, it does buy you quite a bit. And uh, this can be illustrated uh, with a very simple example of the three by three surface code. Uh, so here, what, what I depict is the performance of different realizations of the three by three surface code, uh, where I apply different uh, Clifford operators to change the uh, Pauli basis uh, I use to measure my parity checks. Uh, so on the x-axis, I just uh, list all possible realizations of the surface code. On the y-axis, uh, I plot the uh, logical error rate. And we see that the um, discrepancy between uh, the, the, uh, the best performing uh, surface code and the worst performing uh, surface code spans two orders of magnitude. So indeed, it buys us quite a bit. So now you may be wondering, can there be other noise bias? And this is what brings me to the second part of the talk, which is uh, erasure qubits. Um, so indeed, in, um, in uh, uh, one of the bias that is dominant in various quantum technologies is the bias between the amplitude dumping errors and the phasing errors. Typically, uh, the amplitude dumping time T1 is shorter than the dephasing time T5. So what is the amplitude dumping noise? Uh, typically, uh, we define a qubit um, as a subspace spanned by two states that correspond to different uh, energies. Uh, so uh, the amplitude dumping noise models energy relaxation from the excited state to the ground state that happens with probability gamma. And uh, this, this channel is uh, described by uh, two Krauss uh, operators, K0 and K1 listed on the slide. 
um, it turns out that correcting amplitude damping noise um, is um, fairly simple and it can be done more uh, efficiently than for the depolarizing noise. Uh, for instance, uh, the four qubit code can correct any single amplitude damping event and if we were to correct any single Pauli error, then uh, we would need at least five qubits. Uh, also, uh, the surface code threshold uh, for the amplitude damping noise is 39%, and that should be contrasted with the threshold for the depolarizing noise, that is 18.9%. Uh, so, um, so one question uh, now to answer is, can we leverage this uh, amplitude damping noise that we may have in the system in an efficient way that is compatible with our higher level quantum error correction protocols? And a solution to this question uh, is uh, fairly well known. Uh, it's this simple so-called dual rail uh, encoding. We define a qubit as the subspace spanned by uh, two states, zero, one, and one, zero. And then if the amplitude damping noise is applied uh, to both, um, both uh, qubits independently, uh, then with probability one minus gamma, nothing happens, and with probability gamma, uh, the state is mapped to the state zero, zero, that is orthogonal to the qubit subspace. So when you look at this equation, this simple equation, you realize that this is the definition of what the erasure noise is. Namely, with probability one minus gamma, nothing happens, and with probability gamma, we are mapped to the state that is orthogonal to our qubit subspace. Um, so the dual rail uh, encoding is a realization of this more general idea of erasure qubits. Uh, so here we're after engineering or defining a qubit in a way that the effective noise uh, that we have on that qubit is erasure biased. And as we are going to see in the next slide, correcting erasures is fairly simple. So let's, let's see it with an example. Um, so here I have the, the toric code and I depict the locations of erasures with dark blue color. And so uh, for simplicity what we can do is we can replace each erase qubits uh, with the maximally mixed state there. Uh, this would be equivalent uh, to applying um, a Pauli operator uh, chosen uniformly at random at every single location where the erasure happened. Um, so uh, now if we measure our uh, z parity checks, uh, we can get any syndrome configuration uh, that, uh, that is incident to the locations of the erasures. For instance, the one that I, I depicted here. Uh, so knowing the uh, locations of erasures, that's very important because now a simple decoding procedure that we can follow is within each connected uh, component of erasures, we can move those point-like excitations to the same point within the connected component. And that method works um, very well. This is basically the optimal way to decode uh, those erasures. However, if we didn't know the locations of erasures, we might be tempted to uh, per, uh, per up the point-like syndromes in the following way as I depicted in the slide, and this will lead to a logical error. So knowing the uh, erasure locations is crucial. Um, subsequently, uh, we can get uh, the uh, extremely high threshold for the surface code uh, with erasures, the threshold of 50%. How can we see that? Uh, well, the problem of decoding of erasures in the surface code would map to the bond percolation uh, threshold, uh, to the problem of uh, finding the threshold for the uh, bond percolation in the square lattice, and there the threshold is 50%. Um, so, in addition to erasure errors, we can also have uh, Pauli errors in the system. And then, to solve the decoding problem, uh, we could invoke, for instance, the minimum wave perfect matching decoder that we discussed uh, in a previous slide, or um, the union fine decoder, for instance. And uh, once we have uh, the noise model that uh, comprises erasure errors with rate E and Pauli errors with rate P, uh, what we can do is we can study the correctable region in the EP plane. And the x-axis uh, captures the strength of the erasure noise, the uh, y-axis captures the strength of the Pauli noise, and um, the x-intercept would be the threshold for the erasures, which is pure erasures, which is 
the intercept uh, on, on the y-axis is the threshold for the minimal pressure matching decoder for, in, in this case, um, the bit flip noise, which happens to be 10.3%. And um, in between, um, the boundary interpolates between those two points. And uh, what is the significance of the correctable region? If we are uh, within this region, then by increasing the system size, we can reduce the logical error rate. So uh, that's where we want to be, because then we just scale up our system and we get better and better protection against noise. So what we did in our uh, work uh, is a numerical simulation of a circuit noise uh, where we have herald heralded erasures and Pauli noise. In particular, uh, we consider the standard circuit noise uh, with error rate P, and then on top of that, uh, we assume that each C0 gate can erase both qubits simultaneously, and this can happen with probably TE, and we know about it. So here, I just plotted um, uh, uh, the, the logical error rate as a function of the uh, Pauli error rate uh, for different uh, code distances and fixed erasure rate. Uh, so we see that there is some uh, threshold uh, there. So um, now, if we were to compare the standard protocol uh, how would we proceed if we have these heralded erasures and Pauli noise? Well, we would just forget uh, the information about the locations of erasures. And this would effectively boil down to uh, increasing the um, Pauli error rate of C0 gates. So then we can do the simulation and compare the standard protocol and the erasure protocol. So uh, the standard protocol um, corresponds to the dark region, uh, the erasure protocol corresponds to the light region, and uh, the y-intercept uh, corresponds to the standard for, for both protocols, corresponds to the standard um, threshold for the uh, surface code uh, with um, circuit noise, and that is 0.7%. The x-intercepts differ for different protocols. And uh, we observe that the correctable region for the erasure scheme is 3.5 times uh, larger than for the standard scheme. So it, 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 with this uh, simple trick, we can really um, gain uh, something significant. Uh, so now let me make a comment about imperfect erasure detections. And so, so far, I assume that I know exactly where erasures happen, but that is unrealistic. So we will always have some uh, false positive Q plus and false negative Q minus um, erasure detection. Um, so a false positive means that um, we think that there's an erasure when there's uh, nothing there. And um, a false negative is that we miss the erasure. So false positive are more detrimental and they boil down to increasing the erasure rate. Uh, false negative are more benign uh, so we can tolerate higher um, false uh, negative um, detection uh, rate. Um, in our work, we also looked at the scaling of the sub-threshold, um, the, the sub-threshold scaling of the logical error rate. And here in this plot, what you should be comparing to is the uh, dark blue uh, solid line and the dark blue dashed line. They correspond to the erasure scheme and the standard scheme, respectively. And, and we see that the erasure scheme really uh, outperforms the standard scheme. We also compared the, uh, the erasure scheme with standard schemes, but with significantly reduced error uh, rates. And we see that you know, the erasure scheme can still outperform some of the standard uh, schemes. But now you may be, uh, wait a second. Uh, in order to realize those erasure qubits, you need more resources. And indeed, this is the case. In order to realize one erasure uh, qubit, you need two transmons and one readout resonator. Whereas in the standard scheme, you just need one transmon and one readout resonator. However, transmons are fairly small, so the price you pay is a fairly mild increase in the chip size. Also, I would like to comment that if we have the erasure scheme and we use n transmons, then we're guaranteed to correct up to root n over four erasure errors, whereas with the standard scheme, when we use n transmons, we can only correct root n over eight unknown polys, so we gain there as well. Okay, so in the last uh, two minutes, I would like to very briefly tell you about our recent experiment. So I'm talking about, uh, I hope that I convince you that those erasure qubits uh, can buy us a lot, but can we realize them? So a natural way to realize them would be with uh, neutral atoms. 
where we encode uh, our qubit into some uh, metastable electronic level. And uh, gate errors uh, basically boil down to uh, some processes that move us to subspaces that are disjoint and uh, whose population can be continuously monitored. Uh, but we can also uh, engineer erasure qubits with superconducting circuits. For instance, by taking two uh, coupled microwave cavities, uh, we can realize the erasure qubit, or we can uh, take um, two uh, resonantly coupled transmons, and we can realize the erasure qubit uh, that way. And this is the approach uh, that we took in our experiment. And here, the key idea is uh, the amplitude dumping uh, noise uh, boils down to detectable leakage to the zero, zero state. Uh, so in order to realize, uh, in order to benefit from the idea of erasure qubits, uh, we need to satisfy two requirements. Uh, we need to have a large erasure noise bias that is defined as the rate of the erasures uh, to other errors. And we need to be able to detect erasure errors uh, while uh, not introducing extra errors into the system. And in our experiment, we demonstrated that erasure qubits via the superconducting dual ray encoding meet both of those requirements. In order to realize, uh, in order to verify that we have indeed a large erasure bias, what we did is we did a single uh, qubit randomized benchmarking on the dual rail qubit uh, that was interspersed with frequent erasure checks. And there we saw that the erasure rate uh, is something like four times 10 to the minus three per Clifford gate. And post-selecting on no erasures, we saw that the residual error rate that affects the uh, qubit subspace uh, is 10 to the minus four per Clifford gate. Um, also to, uh, to um, determine whether we can do uh, part, uh, frequent erasure checks, uh, we analyzed false positive and false negative detection events. And uh, we found that the rate of those guys is of the order of 10 to the minus two. Um, lastly, uh, what we also checked is uh, we implemented frequent uh, repeated erasure checks within the fixed time, and we saw that the dephasing uh, uh, rate uh, per check is uh, around 10 to the minus three. So uh, indeed, what we see in our experiment is that the performance is already compatible uh, with the targets that are imposed on the erasure qubits. So that is very great. Um, this brings me to the summary of my talk. And uh, I hope that I convince you that it really pays off to dig a little bit digger, uh, bigger, um, uh, deeper, uh, and uh, to uh, capitalize on the fact that we have more than just qubits and Pauli noise in the system. In the talk, I will, uh, I, I describe to you this, this simple idea, erasure qubits, uh, that really can buy us a lot and can lead to hardware efficient uh, quantum error correction. Also, I said a few words about our recent experiment uh, that realizes erasure qubits with superconducting dual rail encoding. And uh, lastly, I would like to say that if you are interested in quantum error correction and fault tolerance, please reach out to me uh, because I will be starting a group next year and I will have a few uh, positions available. With that, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the beautiful talk. Uh, great results, congratulations. Um, we have time for two questions, maybe. I see it somewhere. Yeah. Thanks, Alexander. That's an excellent talk. Um, I was wondering what the additional gate overhead is if I want to compile like a, a surface code circuit into dual rail qubits. Sorry, uh, extra so gates. The extra gates. I mean, you know, what do I have to do? Because now the dual rail, I guess, CNOTs. And, and, and Hadamard's because uh, right, right. Right. So uh, in the experiment, we didn't realize uh, an entangling gate between uh, two dual rails. Uh, but in um, in the theory paper, we talk about how to do root uh, I swap gate. So with a root I swap gate, with two of them, you can realize an entangling gate that is needed for the uh, for this uh, surface code syndrome extraction. Any other question? Um, I have a question. There's something I didn't understand. So, so okay, you detect it very well by taking the amplitude dumping takes the qubit to the leakage space, and then how is it that you correct? Like, how so do you take it back to the logical space? Right. So say one, yeah. Right. So your recovery um, would uh, could follow um, 
for instance, in, the, in this way, uh, you detect that you got erased, and then you reinitialize that qubit in the qubit subspace. So for instance, you put it in the logical zero or logical one, or if you want to, uh, you can do it um, you, you in a maximum mimic state. Mm -hmm. And then you know there are two different uh, possible avenues. You do it in a conditional way, uh, given you measure the erasure check, mm -hmm. you reinitialize your qubit, or maybe there is some uh, physical uh, process, a passive process, that whenever you're in the zero, zero state, mm -hmm. you get back to the qubit mm -hmm. subspace. And when you reprepare like that, you destroy entanglement with the rest of the state, but that can be treated as a normal error. Uh, that's right. That's and it. then, you know, you repeat your parity check on this erasure that's qubit, it. and that effectively uh, entangles the qubit right. back to the code. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. So, shall we thank the speaker again?